my name is Grace Weaver. I'm a recent graduate of the UVM art department. I'm a painter. Um, and rather than doing a typical slide lecture today and showing you my work in a linear history, I want to try something a little different. I hope that this talk will be like a visit to my studio. Um, I'm going to show you what I'm looking at, and then we'll see my paintings along the way. I should first talk a little bit about how I'm making these paintings, because it's a pretty unusual process. They're rubbery and sort of synthetic looking, and that's the result of this really unforgiving technique that I've come up with. Um, the paintings are basically made backwards. I begin with the outline, and then I finish with the choices of basic colors. I start out by laying a line down onto glass and fill it in with planes of flat color and then build that up in um, layers of acrylic until I have this rubbery skin of paint. And then to that skin, I attach canvas and peel the whole thing off of the glass. Um, so the method basically reverses the traditional structure of painting, foregrounding the underdrawing as the topmost layer. I want to stress that there's a re revolving door mechanism that connects my work to the art history that I look at. Um, uh, like, or other images, like olive oil, for instance. So what happens in a painting will remind me of an artwork, um, say, Persian, painting, per Persian miniature painting, and then I'll do research into that, and then that might be reflected in the next work. Um, this painting on the left, Saucy Flosser, pulls directly from 17th and 18th century miniature painting from the Punjab hills of India, an example of which is on the right. And it's also a play on the motif of a lady at her toilette albeit a slightly comic one. These are characters for sure, but they have an indirect relationship to real people. They're doll-like and nearly human, but not quite. Like dolls, they have the quality of being surrogate bodies. They end up being repositories for whatever sensation I choose to invest them with. The figures are built up out of curves and curly cues. They're amalgams of features and limbs stolen from art history and elsewhere, but anatomically impossible in combination. While my work thus far has sprung from this sort of romp through art history, uh, at a certain point, the formal kinship between my paintings and Indian art became undeniable. I wanted to know if the connection between Indian art and my own work went beyond the formal one. I knew I had to go to India. So I planned this research project centering on Hindu bronzes, and I went to South India last summer for five months. I worked as an artist in residence at a museum called Dakshina Chitra in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, and I put on an exhibition there. As a figurative artist, I saw this trip as a sort of visual pilgrimage to a place where the human form is exalted above all. India is this place of superabundance, but what emerges from it is a distilled, congealed art. It's an art of ideal love, heroic archetypes, and visions of an ultra-perfect heavenly realm. Again and again, Indian art returns to the motif of lover and beloved as metaphor for the gamut of emotional experience. Indian painting departs from reality and makes its own dream-like two-dimensional world. While it steals vocabulary from nature, it does so in a way that's abstracted and schematized until nature is hardly recognizable. These are impulses I share, and once I'd opened the door to Indian painting, um, I knew I had this treasure chest of forms and designs that I could draw on endlessly. So I went to India with all these big questions in mind. What sort of world insists on an art that can't be hemmed in by representational reality? What sort of world is the backdrop for an art of iconic stories and romantic love? What I found was a shared ethic at the core of both Indian art and my own motivation to draw and paint. What I recognized in Indian culture was this wish to confront fundamental emotions, love and loss, desire and betrayal, and to do so honestly and earnestly. In the wake of my time in India, I've confronted the romantic core of my practice, and I'm doing so partially because it seems like this impossibly hard thing to do in the context of contemporary art. I found a lot of meaning in speaking to artworks of the distant past, but I believe that art grows out of dialogue, and I want to know where my intentions fit in with the art of our time. In the contemporary art work world, you don't see many paintings that center on the romantic, made in complete sincerity. In American visual culture, romantic themes seem to be the exclusive province of the kitsch and the cliché. The stories of Indian art are that country's version of Romeo and Juliet, 
simple narratives that manage to be universally relatable. I've looked for these values in American culture, and I found them in the most bubblegum of contemporary pop music. I found them in the work of Taylor Swift and her simple confessional songs about personal experience, songs that win the empathy of a massive, diverse audience. What does it mean that her work is so often dismissed at face value for its girly quality? What does that say about how we value the insights of young women? Like a novelist writes the book she wants to read, I think that often the painter makes the painting she wants to see. And so I'm trying to find meaning in what has become cliche, Prince Charming, the valiant hero, the girl consumed by unrequited love. In my paintings, I'm trying to capture longing in its many permutations. These are all quite pre-modern aims, paintings to incite pleasure in the viewer, trying to communicate psychology through the human form. And so recently, I've been wondering, what would it mean to make a sincerely, rom sincerely romantic painting? What would it mean to make a girly painting? What would it mean to make the painterly equivalent of a Nicki Minaj, a Katy Perry, a, or a Taylor Swift song? In doing so, I began to wonder why, in the hierarchy of aesthetics, why do the girly and the cute get pushed so low? When optimism does crop up in art and music, we seem to have two avenues for processing it. Optimism is read either as irony or as stupidity. What does this reticence to accept op optimism say about us as an art audience? A friend of mine recently commented that the figure on the left has a rambunctious optimism to him. Um, or in center. <laughs> That's a quality I find worth pursuing. I'm for an art that can accommodate the full spectrum of emotional experience, including buoyancy, optimism, and lightness. I'm for an art in which the cute and the comic, the whimsical and the girly, hold the same credence as the beautiful and the sublime.